attention is to please turn your Bible still to the Gospel of Mark chapter 15 and verse 33. As I said, you find the Lord Jesus Christ was at this point already crucified. In fact, if you look behind at verse 25, you realize that it was 9 a.m. in the morning when the Roman soldiers crucified him and placed him on the cross. When you come to verse 33, it was already noon. It was already 12 noon, three hours after he was crucified. Now, brothers and sisters, you should not be horrified by all these things as if it was a surprise, that it was unexpected. No, 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 brothers and sisters. The Lord Jesus Christ came into this world to die. To die on a cross, as we say, predicted in the Old Testament, as I explained to you just now. And in fact, as he made this last journey to Jerusalem, he had already told his disciples it will end with his death. If you would just turn with me, brothers and sisters, to Mark chapter 10, and that is what you find the Lord Jesus saying in verse 33 to verse 34. To Mark chapter 10, verse 33 to verse 34. See, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And he will rise after three days. That is what the Lord Jesus Christ had earlier told his disciples. Now, brothers and sisters, three hours after the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, you find Mark recording here some things that happened while they were all observing the happenings on the cross at Calvary. First, you find the Lord Jesus Christ making two statements from the cross. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ actually made more than two. But since the Gospel of Mark only recorded two, we will just look at these two that we find here recorded for us in the Gospel of Mark. Look at verse 34 where we are told of the first statement. And at 3, 3 p.m., 3 hours after uh, noon, that means six hour, almost 6 hours since He was on the cross, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama samachthani, which is translated, My God, My God, why have you abandoned me? This was predicted, the very word, word for word, a quotation from an earlier prophet of God in ancient time from Psalm 22 and verse 1. And the word I want to call your attention to is the word, Abandon me. Himself, as it were, God was turning his face away and looked in the opposite direction. God didn't want to help. God didn't want to see. And God was leaving the Lord Jesus Christ to suffer alone. That was the feeling, the despair, the Lord Jesus substitute. He had come to die for them. And so as He was on the cross, all the sins of His people, they were all placed on Him because He will die for the sins of His people. And sin separates. Sin separates people from God. Sin brings misery. You see, brothers and sisters, you were born in sin. From the moment you were conceived, from the moment you came into this world, you were already separated from God. Therefore, you have come to accept this as natural. You, you will accept this as normal. But the Lord Jesus Christ had never been separated from God. The Lord Jesus Christ is sinless. And as a sinless Son of God, He was never separated from His Father from all eternity. And that is why, brothers and sisters, he felt this despair when, as it was sin, the sin that was upon him, the sins of his people, as he carried for them, God turned his face and allowed him to suffer the consequences of sin. You will not face this despair. 
because you have come to accept this as normal. When you think of God turning His face from you when you are in misery and trouble, you say, so I will. It has always been the same. You do not feel anything when you are not even having a relationship with God. But the Lord Jesus Christ here is demonstrating and revealing to us that this is the despair that every one of us feel because we are sinners, we are separated from God. We cannot feel that there is nothing wrong and that is natural. Being natural is the worst thing to happen to you, brothers and sisters. Look at what then the second thing that we are told there in, in uh, verse 37 at 3 p.m. You find the Lord Jesus Christ making His last cry from the cross of Calvary. Verse 37 says, Jesus let out a loud cry and breathed His last. What did He say? What is the cry? Well, John, in the Gospel of John chapter 19 and verse 30 says, The Lord Jesus, the last words, the last cry was, Finish! Finished, he said. Loudly, he said, finished. And then he died. The word, it is finished, is actually one word in Greek. It means, completed. Done. I have done it. I have finished it. The work that has been assigned me in the coming into this world to die for sinners. It was a shout of victory. It is not a despair. He was not saying, Liao la, Liao la, and die la, ya, pini, mei chiu la, mei chiu. He is not saying that. In fact, it is a cry of a victor. Done! Finally, I have done it. I have achieved it. The Lord Jesus Christ has finished what God has sent him into this world to do. He has accomplished salvation, the forgiveness of sin for his people. If you will come. If you will come to Him this morning, no matter what sin you have committed, no matter how troubled your conscience is, if you will just come and say, Lord, I heard that you are the, the Savior of sinners. I have, I have not been a perfect person. I fail in so many things. Will you forgive me? The Lord Jesus will say to you, It is finished. It's done. 2,000 years ago when I was at the cross of Calvary, I had already died for my people. And God, my Father in heaven, will accept them because I have become their representative and their substitute. We are told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in Him, we might become the righteousness of God. Two things happen on the cross when you see the Lord Jesus Christ saying, It is finished! God, in exchange for the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, have what we would call an exchange for our sin. Our sins all fall on Him because He became our substitute. And all His goodness He pour on us. You are accepted by God today not because you are good and you are better than others. God accept you, God you hear your prayer and God receive you. It is because He always remember that Jesus Christ has suffered for you and has purchased for you your salvation. Notice here brothers and sisters that it was a loud cry as you are told there if you read carefully in verse 37, Jesus let out a loud voice. You understand that it was not a voice that is exhausted because at this point, many of the people hanging there for six hours and they were about to die, they would all be powerless. Right? They will be so tired and exhausted. They will be, maybe they can say, fin fin finish, but not, it is finished. As a person with strength even, it is finished. A person who was not exhausted yet. In other words, brothers and sisters, Jesus did not die because he was weak and because he was physically exhausted. Jesus died because it was time for him to die. 
And since he came into this world to die, he has decided the time has come. It is now that I will die, and therefore I will give out my last breath. And he died. And this is all captured for us here this morning as we read. If you turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 10, if please, some of you help others who may not know how to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 10. You will read there in verse 17 to verse 18 these words from our Lord Jesus Himself. John 10, 17 to 18 reads, This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. The Lord was very clear. Yes, He died on the cross of Calvary, but He died because He wanted to. He died because He decided to. He died because it was God, a part of God's plan to save His people. He must taste death so that He can help you, He can sympathize with you, so that when you, your, it is your turn to die and you are afraid and you pray to Him, He can tell you, I know, I know, I know, I died before. And He can be a comforter, a saviour to everybody. You will die one day, brothers and sisters, when He calls for you, you will die. Until He calls for you, you can be sure that nothing will happen to you. And that was exactly what happened in the Philippines during the Second World War. There was a great and mighty battle going on there in, in the islands of Philippines. And, uh, and the American General MacArthur was there. He had in an initial time of the war fled. And then he, the Americans sent him back again. And so he said to the Filipinos, I have returned. And so he landed there and he was preparing for the bombing of Japan and all these things. And you know what happened? The Japanese knew that he had returned. And so they were bombing where he was. And bomb was falling from the sky on his left and on his right in the room where he had called for a meeting with all his assistants and all. And every one of them was jumping and crying, crawling under the table. But General MacArthur, as we are told by eyewitnesses, he stood straight and he stood sure and he was looking at all his soldiers all crawling under the table hiding from the bombs and all the shelling and when everything was silent he told them nothing will happen to you as just as nothing happened to me unless it is time for me to die brothers and sisters crying will not help you crying will not save you no matter how in despair you are, nothing will change. When God calls, <clears throat> until God calls, nothing will happen to you. Trust then in God, my brothers and sisters. The second thing I want to draw your attention to, as it happened there, recorded for us, is found in verse 35 to verse 36. You find bystanders, all the capo people, all the people surrounding there at the place called Calvary and they were all looking at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at what you are told there in verse 35 to verse 36. When some of those standing there heard this, they said, See, he is calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and fixed it on a stick, offered him a drink and said, Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. You realize that none of their names is given here. They are all nameless people. They were all just looking at what is happening. And they were all hoping to see a miracle. The Lord Jesus Christ had said, Eloi, Eloi, which means my God, my God in Aramaic language. But these people, I don't know for what reason, they heard the name Elijah, Elijah. And it's two different things, brothers and sisters. We are here looking at a group of people who misunderstood what Jesus said. They were not listening carefully. They misunderstood and they allowed their own ideas to take over them. 
and deceived them and brought them to a wrong conclusion about everything that happened. God has sent Jesus Christ to die. And yet these people was thinking that God will send Elijah to rescue him. Isn't that going to be a contradiction? The Lord from ancient times said that he will die on a cross. And now these people were saying that, oh, he's praying and then let's see Elijah will come and rescue him. That was what was happening here, brothers and sisters. The misunderstanding, the many callous people who hear the Christian message wrongly and they allow their misunderstanding to take over them and they look for forgiveness, they look for the love of God in a very, very, very wrong way. There are a lot of people who say this. They say that Mary was the mother of Jesus. And Mary was loved by Jesus. Hey, if Mary was loved by Jesus, hey, let's go to Mary and ask Mary, ask Mary for help. Lah. Because if Mary speak for us, pray for us, Jesus will never say no to her. And so you find a lot of people in this world, they pray to Mary. They go to Mary and say, Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, especially at the hour of our dying. And they thought that, ah, since Jesus loves you, He will hear your prayer for me. Forgetting this, the Lord Jesus Christ already told us that if you are husband and wife in this life, when you die, go to heaven, you are no longer husband and wife. You will be like the angels of God. You are no longer married as husband. There is no man or woman in, the, in among the angels. Similarly, if you are mother and son in this life, in a world to come, there is no longer such relationship. Mary cannot help you because Mary was a human being. And in heaven, uh, Mary is just like anybody else, servants of God. That's exactly what happened in our Chinese culture as well. Wang Kongdo, Wang Di, was a very powerful, successful, victorious and brave warrior, general. He won many wars, he was known for his bravery, he was known for his brotherhood. And so people started to pray to him after he died and say, Quan Di, Quan Di, you know, Quan Kong, Quan Kong, protect me, protect my family. And then you find policemen in Hong Kong, all the policemen will pray to a, a statue of Quan Ti, and they say that all policemen must have Quan Ti for his protect for our protection. And what is the cause of it? Because they saw Quan Ti as a brave, successful fighter, and therefore if he protect me, and nobody will dare to come near me. You see the thinking? It's wrong thinking, brothers and sisters. It's wrong thinking that leads people to worship false gods and false things. The same thing, our feeling. We look at our father. After our father died, we cry, Papa, Mama, Papa, and they cry. And then we look at our young children and say, Papa, you die already. In heaven, please protect your grandchildren. Please help them to study hard, help them to, be, to do well in school, and then when they grow up, please look upon them favorably and do everything in your power to protect your descendants. My brothers and sisters, that is provided your, your, grand, your father has the power to do so. But the Bible tells us that when after death is the judgment, there is no connection between those who are alive and those who are dead. But people continue to think this way, Christians or no Christians. People continue to seek the blessing of their ancestors, thinking that because I am your descendants, surely you will do everything to help us. When there is no connection, when there is no possibility, brothers and sisters. The same thing here. They listen. Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi. And then they heard, Elijah, Elijah. And they said, ah, let's wait and see Elijah will come. The Lord has never made such a promise and made such a prayer to Elijah in the first place. You see, they are looking at the wrong place. Look at what happened in verse 33. It, when it was noon, Darkness came over the whole land until 3 p.m. in the afternoon. <laughs> they were not bothered by all these things. This is something unnatural, never happened before. Wow, so dark the cloud and so threatening the thunder and the lightning. Something must be happening. And for three long hours, it never go away. It has never been so long. What is happening? They were not bothered by all these things. 
they were controlled by their misunderstanding. They were so stubborn. They already made up their mind. Jesus deserved to die. He is a false prophet. We will not believe in him. And they hold on to their human ignorance and human stubbornness. I hope you are not like that. I don't know what's your bias. I really don't know why you find it so hard to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know what is your tradition or what you have been brought up in the past. But I just ask you, are you like one of those here who heard wrongly from people who have taught you wrongly and you continue to be stubborn to this very hour? Jesus said, if you will not believe in Him, you will never receive another supernatural message from God. Look at the Gospel of Matthew, please. The Gospel of Matthew and chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. And listen to what Jesus is warning to people like that. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. Matthew 12, verse 39 to verse 14. The Holy Bible says, An evil and adulterous generation demands a supernatural sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. They were looking for Elijah instead of looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. What about you, brothers? What about you, sisters? Children? Are you looking for miracles? Are you looking for magic? Or are you looking at Christ as He has claimed to be from God? There is only one command to you from the Lord Jesus as you live in this modern world today. Not to look for Elijah's coming. Not to look for miracles. But listen, He says, Repent and be baptized, each of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for everyone who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Will you hear? Will you respond? Will you come and learn more about the Lord Jesus Christ? Thirdly, brothers and sisters, you find the temple curtain torn. Look at what you are told there in verse 38. Mark chapter 15 and verse 38 says, Then the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This curtain was actually a very big piece of cloth, a curtain, very thick too. And then it was meant to block the inside of the temple from the outside of the temple. It was meant to block the Ark of the Covenant and the, and the altar of incense from the outside, the exterior of the temple. So that if you ever go to the temple building in ancient time, you will go to the main door and you'll find a priest in the outside of the temple making all their duties and fulfilling all their obligations. And then there was this curtain, thick, and a very threatening curtain. And you see that you cannot look into what is inside. You cannot even peek into what is behind it. And no way will they allow you to go behind that curtain because that's where the presence of God was represented in ancient time. It was meant, that curtain was meant to teach you in ancient time that the access to God was blocked. You have no direct access to God. Why? Because you are a sinner. If you rush into the presence of God, you will be struck dead because the wages of sin is death. And God is a God of holiness. He will not accept you because you come in all your sins. But the Bible tells us when Jesus died, the first thing immediately that happened would be that this curtain that so thick and hanging there was torn into two. Look here, brothers and sisters. It was torn from the top. It was not torn from the bottom. From the bottom, it will be from man. Man tearing the curtain. 
But from the top, it was so high. Even if you use a ladder, it will be a very high ladder to reach the top. Who could carry it from the top? God. Why did God tear the curtain? Because the Son of God has already died nearby at Calvary. And when He died, this curtain is removed. To teach you this, brothers and sisters, that now with His death, access to God is available freely. You no longer have to go to the temple of God and be blocked. You now have access into the presence of God. Not because you are good. You are still a sinner. But it is because He, who is the friend and the saviour of sinners, He has taken all your sin. And when God tear and tore the curtain and look at you, He doesn't see you anymore. He sees and He remembers, Ah, these are the people that the Son of God has died for on the cross of Calvary. That is why Christians always talk about Jesus. That is why non-Christians don't understand. They ask me, so many times, Pastor, Pastor, why you all talk about Jesus all the time? It is because Jesus meant the world to us. Without Jesus, there is no reason for us to be happy. There is no hope. But Jesus has become our Savior and our Lord. And so I call upon you this morning, will you take this privilege? The curtain has been removed by God from heaven. Will you come and seek God and know that there is God? There is a God for you to seek and there is a God for you to know. Will you come and know Him and love Him and serve Him and obey Him? I want to call your attention now next to the another, another thing that was happening. If you look there in verse 39. The four things that happened at this point in time as the Lord Jesus was on the cross. You find there in verse 39, this statement, Mark 15 and verse 39. You find the centurion confessing Christ. He says, when the centurion who was standing opposite him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. What caused this centurion to make such a fantastic statement? A centurion would be the leader of 100 Roman soldiers. He will be in charge of 100 Roman soldiers. A century. A centurion coming from the word. A century. What's a century? A century is 100 years. So, 100 soldiers under his care. We are talking about somebody who rose through the rank, you know. In the Roman army, you have to join as an ordinary soldier and then through your show of bravery and fighting skills, slowly, slowly, slowly you will rise and then you become a centurion. A hard fighting warrior, battle worn warrior, somebody with great experience in killing as well as he has seen so many people being killed. He was a very hardened man. He had many cuts. He had many, many terrible sights that he has seen, blood being shed, people's head being chopped off in a, in a terrible fighting in a war. But he had never seen, he had never seen a human being dying like the Lord Jesus Christ before. He seen so many bodies die, he had killed so many bodies, but as he was observing the Lord Jesus Christ, we are two here, opposite, standing opposite the Lord Jesus Christ, and he saw, he heard everything that Jesus said on the cross. He saw everything that happened to him, and even now, at this very, very last moment, he saw how Jesus breathed his last and died. He came to the conclusion, and he has never seen somebody die like that before. Truly, he said, this man was the son of God. Because Jesus did not die of physical exhaustion. Everybody who died on the cross crucified and died. Everybody died because they had no more strength. Their blood drained out. They were hung there for so many hours under the hot sun. And then they died. But at this moment, the centurion could see there was still full of strength and full of life in this person. 
In fact, his last words was finish! And it was full of vitality, full of power. And it was so loud. He has never heard a crucified person screaming so loudly, finish! And then die. You see, brothers and sisters, he cried, finished. Not as a defeated man. He cried, finished! Because he had finished what God has sent him to do. This man, this centurion, this hardened, hardened soldier, observed the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and he heard everything Jesus said. Of course, he also heard what people said about him. Lah. He did not see any miracle because he didn't see Elijah coming to rescue him. He only heard what Jesus said. And he believed. History tells us that this soldier eventually became a Christian. You, you were not even alive 2,000 years ago. None of you saw the Lord Jesus Christ. But you heard him as we read his words from the Holy Bible. Will you accept what he said in the Bible? You may say, ah, how can I believe? I didn't see how, how can I believe? I didn't hear him say. How can I believe? It's so long ago, 2,000 years ago. Well, this man didn't hear anything else. He didn't see a miracle and he believed. There are many others who did so, brothers and sisters. Listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe him. This is the kind of people that we must be. The more we read the Bible, the more we realize that the Bible is the Word of God that we can believe. And we'll build our lives around it. And I call you, brothers and sisters, to think seriously as to what I'm saying to you this morning. We come eventually to the last group of people we find. The last point I want to call your attention to is found in Mark chapter 15. Look at what you are told there in verse 40 to 41. Mark 15, 40 to 41, you find a woman. There were also women watching from a distance. Among them was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and Solomon. In Galilee, this woman followed him and took care of him. Many other women had come up with him to Jerusalem. You don't hear such things in other religions. Women were treated very lowly and badly in ancient times, but not by our Lord Jesus Christ and not by Christians, as we are told here in the Bible. It was the Lord Jesus Christ who actually uplifted women in modern society. Who were the people who fought for women voting right? Women had no voting right until this, the church stood up, the Christians stood up, and fought for them to have a right to vote. Who were the people who came up and said that women should be paid for their job the same salary as the men? I can still remember when I was a boy listening to my father and my father and my mother talking and they were always saying this, that, you know, men always got paid more when women actually sometimes they do the same job and they do even work harder. Why men always ended up having more pay than this woman who may be doing the same job and working harder? And my father and my mother will always say, Yalah, I think men need more money than women. But who make it a law? Brothers and sisters, not the Buddhists, not the Hindu, not anybody else. Not in Japan, not in China, not in Korea. It's always in the better days when Christianity was the majority in Western countries. The society, under the hearing of the Gospel and, and the influence of the Bible, they came together and fought for women rights. And that is why men and women today, we are all standing on this, actually a Christian influence. I do not wish to say that of other countries. You only need to look at India to know that women were always raped, molested, and women were treated very badly. Women daughters being thrown into the river to be drowned because they were born women, but not in Christian society. Do you know that Christians were the one who adopted girls from orphanages 
in China, in Korea, in other parts of Southeast Asia, and brought back to America and in England to be raised. I have a friend who adopted it from Taiwan, and she was handicapped in many ways, and she was, as you know, born of Chinese ancestry, but then brought up by, uh, by, by the Westerners. And so she spoke like a Westerner because she was brought up by a, uh, adopted by a Western couple. But she always say, I'm so interested, I'm so interested. One day I must go back to, to Taiwan to find out who was my biological father and my biological mother and whether I have any blood-related brothers and sisters. What caused these people to adopt? Well, because of the Christian influence. Whether you are male or female, you are precious in the sight of God. God is the creator of man and woman, and we are all the same. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who gave us that. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, at this point, if I may just call your attention to this, all the male disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, every one of them had already ran for their life. They fled. Who were the ones who remained behind? The woman disciples. They were the only one here, as we are told here, they were the only one left behind to care for the Lord Jesus Christ. Examples of faithfulness and loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ. You listen, listen. They did not love Christ in good times. They showed their true love for Jesus Christ, especially in bad times. The woman disciple had loved Christ so much that they could not leave him to die alone on the cross at Calvary. They will want to be there. If he has to die, we will make sure that we are all here to encourage him and to do for him whatever we can do for him. Brothers and sisters, what about you? Are you a Christian because you think that God will bless you? God will protect you? God is so good to you? Will you be a Christian if the time comes when you are arrested like in, in Russia or in, in, in China, in Africa, in Muslim country where Christians are attacked and Christians are arrested and put in prison? Will you still say you are a Christian? Their love clings to the Lord Jesus Christ even when their intellect cannot comprehend what was happening. Why must he die? What did he do wrong? He didn't understand. They didn't understand, but their heart loved Jesus. If you die, Lord, we will still be here waiting for you. There are many spiritual things that we cannot explain today. But brothers and sisters, will you still cling on to the words and promises of the Lord Jesus Christ? Christ suffered on the cross for six hours before he died, before he decided to die. But it is not the end of his story. Remember? What did he say? They will kill him. But three days later, he will rise again from the dead. And that is what we constantly and regularly want to remember. And that is what the Lord Jesus Christ has instructed us to do in the partaking of the Lord's Supper. He says, every time you observe this sacrament, you are to remember that I have died. But three days after my death, I have risen from the dead and that I am coming back soon for you. And that's what we want to do now as we prepare ourselves. Let us pray.